It was the year Mother Nature struck back. 2011, the year American farmers truly dug in. We are just hearing now that there's a tornado emergency. A large wedge tornado has been spotted. It was just so bad. You just, it was beyond what you could ever even imagine. The National Weather Service says we are in one of the worst droughts on record. Can't go that long without water. It wasn't just not having the rain, it was so hot. It just killed that cornfield. The Army Corps of Engineers is going to blow up a levee that will save Cairo, Illinois, but flood Missouri farmland. We just went over a bunch of our property in a boat, about 18, 19 foot of water. Water is going to do a lot of damage. Hurricane Irene's incredible winds will be causing damage all the way up through New England. Mother Nature last year was absolutely vicious. No, you get too depressed to even watch the weather. Nature makes you want to try harder. The American spirit. Nowhere is it more evident than in our nation's farming and ranching families. The hard lives they lead make our lives better. For today, it's not just about putting food on our tables. They feed and fuel the country and the world. The farmer, that's what keeps our country going. When the farmer ain't gonna make it, nobody's gonna make it. The thing that people have to consider is that their food does not come from the grocery store. It's produced on an acre of land somewhere. I mean, I think they know where it comes from. They just don't know where it comes from. Our income is planting and harvesting that crop. We have to produce an acre of something. But you got all kinds out there. You got first, second, third generation farmers. But every day you, you farm, you, you see what you make. I mean, you see the crop grow, you see the buildings grow, you see the family grow on it. The thing that's so different in farming that people don't realize is that we invest millions of dollars in an acre of crop, never having uh, anything but a good guess that we'll be able to harvest it and, and derive an income. There's nothing any better than harvest. We look forward to it all year. I mean, it's when the money comes in and you've worked all year for it. I mean, we don't get a paycheck every week, like a lot of people. I mean, money only comes in during harvest. Harvest is fun. I mean, you get up in the morning, you get started, you work all day, you work into the night. I'm my own boss. You know, me and my dad, how many people can work side by side their dad every day? That's probably one of the best things. And now that I've got three boys, they're all showing an interest. So that makes me want to go rent more ground. It makes me want to try harder. It's really hard to get across to, to people that aren't related to farming how intense the capital requirement is to buy the equipment, uh, to cash flow enough money to, to make the payments, and to invest a couple of million dollars in something that you're, you're at risk because of what ever Mother Nature throws at you during that year. I've never seen the river rise this quickly. Bigger than anything I'd ever seen, and I, in fact, I guess as big as anybody I'd ever seen. We were hoping and praying that, you know, something would change. In 2011, Mother Nature brought heavy winter storms to the northern Plain states. As the snows melted and ran south through the Great American Rivers, it mixed with torrential spring rains, causing the mighty Mississippi to swell and threaten the communities that farm on its banks. I was talking to a family in the Dakotas, and we were talking about the, the snowfall amounts. And I said, yeah, that, that all has to come by us. The school children went to the local armory and filled up sandbags, and they knew they were going to have a problem. You know, you watch the forecast as a farming community all the time to see what's going to happen with the weather. We were looking at the weather, and they had had an extended forecast that called for it to be pretty relatively dry for about 10 days, and then they changed it about seven days out to a small rain event. As we got closer to that, that weekend, it turned into a tremendous amount of uh, rain. 
The farmers of southeast Missouri watched the waters of the Mississippi rise higher and higher. They knew that their levee was built lower than the others, making their farmlands the spillway that would deflect flooding elsewhere. We were suffering backwater flooding and one more heavy rain and most of the town was going to be underwater. Another two or three days are forecast. Just don't know uh, how we're going to be able to handle this much water again. There's just really nowhere for the water to go. And in southern Illinois, the water on their levee was causing a great deal of pressure. When you get that much water in that short period of time, it has to come by. It has to come by Carroll, Illinois. All the efforts to stop the Army Corps of Engineers to blow up the levee have been exhausted. Now it's just a matter of hours. There was a good possibility that they might have to use the floodway for the first time in like 73 years. We never as a community thought, thought it was something that we would, uh, would face in our lifetime. The United States Army Corps of Engineers determined that the quickest way to relieve the pressure on the Mississippi River was to blow up the levee that protected southeast Missouri farmland. The Corps had a plan that was established by the 1928 Flood Control Act to, to utilize the, the floodway. Everybody started going in and starting uh, getting equipment out and getting valuables out of homes. Boy, at that time, it, uh, it didn't look good. For them to be naive enough to think that 133,000 acres of the most productive farmland in the whole United States could be just done away with at the snap of a finger is ridiculous to me. That, that 133,000 acres will feed 1.36 million people in the course of a year. That's nothing to sneeze at when we have people starving here in the U.S., and especially people that are starving overseas. We had some of the prettiest corn we've had in years, dark green corn. We put dry fertilizer on over the top. And about the time that happened, we never got any more rain. It just it looked like it was going to be a hell of a year, and everything looked good. The corn was pretty enough, good enough stand. Moisture was there. We decided it needed more nitrogen, so we come in over the top. Big mistake. <laughs> Normal year, that should have worked. This year, that was just like taking $100 bills and burning them. It just got hot for 30-some days, over 100 degrees. It just cooked it from the inside out with no rain on it. It's hot. It's dry. No, it's dry. It rained in a month. Have you seen the weather? Yeah. It's not even supposed to rain. What if it doesn't rain? What if we don't have any money this fall? All it's going to take is one little rain. And they called me uh, one afternoon and said, hey, the National Guard was here, and they were ordering everyone to evacuate. As the water continued to rise in the Ohio River, millions of gallons were being dumped into the Mississippi River, threatening the levees that protected Cairo, Illinois. The Army Corps of Engineers, under the leadership of Major General Michael J. Walsh, readied plans to blow up a section of the levee on the Missouri side of the river, according to a flood plan that was set by Congress in 1928. Just got back from the meeting with the Corps. Uh, what was your uh, perception about what they're getting ready to do? The levee was designed to allow water to come over the top naturally in the event of a flood. The Missouri farmers inside the spillway tried to convince the Army Corps of Engineers to not blow up their levee. OK, yeah. All right, call me when, you, uh, when you've got a plan. I was just uh, talking to uh, a congressional aide of our congresswoman, uh, Joanne Emerson. She's been very uh, supportive in helping us deal with uh, what's going on right now with the uh, Corps of Engineers. There was considerable pressure applied uh, for them not to do it. Uh, but I think once they, they got the final forecast, they decided, well, they're just going to do it. It's, it's just farmland, but it's, you know, it's very productive farmland. Yeah, we just, uh, we just had a private meeting with General Walsh uh, 
and it didn't go very well. We were trying to uh, convince him that there would be a different way that we could uh, handle the situation other than blowing up the levee, but uh, he just wouldn't hear of it. Okay, we just got a call. Uh, we have a new river forecast coming out and need to get to Illinois uh, to my headquarters and move some equipment before it gets stranded and goes underwater. So that's where I'm headed. I just got the weather updates and the updated maps, and it appears they are going to miss all of the rain down where they need it. The forecast is hot and dry for the next six to ten days. Temps could be up to 100. Been rain for six weeks, and we got three inches, and then it quit raining for another six weeks. It's been 100 degrees for 30 to 40 days. Corn can't take it. It'll never pollinate. You got a couple days left? Uh, no, not really. That there is just a bad deal. We need rain and need it now. Odds are we're going to lose this crop. If you get really hot when corn's supposed to be pollinating, you kill that pollen that is a dramatic impact and it's irreversible and that can really make things go crazy. And as you can see, we still have no moisture in the ground. The rain wouldn't hurt these beans. A lot of sleepless nights. You know, you just lay there and you flip and you flop and maybe you did hear on the radio that there was a chance to rain at night, so you just wait. I'd sit there and listen to the thunder, thinking it was going to rain. I'd get up every 30 minutes, walk out on the porch. I was so loud. I could have swore any second it'd start raining. Oh, it probably in the next county north, just like it's been all year. It's not raining, but then, you know, say the bugs come in. And you've still got to hire someone to come in and spray your crops for those bugs, and that costs money. And obviously, you know, you got to put your fertilizer on it. And at some point, you're like, where do you stop when you know that you're not going to have, you know, a huge return? So, but you always do it in hopes that, you know, that rain's going to come in and save you. Two thousand eleven, a year for the record books. Tornadoes in the south, floods in the central states, a hurricane in the northeast, and drought, season-long drought that affected crops getting to the table and the ethanol plants. It was a year that Mother Nature truly struck back. There is a tornado emergency in effect. Late afternoon, um, Randy was out spraying beans. Um, and I was actually in the basement with my plumber working on our air conditioner. We're advising everyone to take shelter immediately. And when I came upstairs, I could see the sky was blue out to the west. So I turned on the TV and checked, and at that time it was like 30 miles from here. I was up north spraying on the north farm, and they kept telling me it's going to go south, going to go south, going to go south. I kept watch. I knew it wasn't just coming this direction. So I relayed the message. The guys decided to bring everything home um, and start putting stuff away. And that's what we were doing when it hit. It come fast when it come. There was a wall of debris coming our way, or wind and dust. So we could hear hailstones hitting the house. I slammed the door. We ran the basement. And then through the air exchanger, you hear all the bends cracking and smacking. And then we come back up here later, and the dryer was on fire, 40 feet liquid flame because it broke a line. It was still raining. We had 12,000 gallons of diesel fuel within 400 feet of that flame. But it was spooky. You don't know where to go. You're stunned. In shock. Well, we spent 30 years building the place, and it was gone. And when that hit, the the empty bins are bouncing like ping pong balls off the full one. Four buildings, 13 grain bins. The new combine just arrived, 45 minutes before the storm hit, dropped the shed on top of that. That caused 12,000 damage. 
I wouldn't wish it on anybody. That ain't fun. As flooding in the Mississippi increased, on the Illinois side, the levees began to fail. A friend called and said, hey, I got the forecast for the river. You may want to go down and, and uh, try to get some equipment out. And I said, thank you, and drove down there, and it was too late. I couldn't get to my shop. Well, that turned out to be a wasted drive. Uh, river's just coming up too fast. We're already cut off. The only way to get to the farms was by boat. It's time to get back in the boat and go back over and start moving things to even higher ground and higher shelves. And hopefully we won't be doing the same thing again tomorrow. So there we go. Although the rivers were cresting, the failing levees were threatening the town of Cairo, Illinois. It was time for General Walsh of the Army Corps of Engineers to make a decision. This is a, a story of the human dimension, and, and certainly uh, it's, a, it's impacting lots of folks. As you uh, fly up and down the river, you'll see a lot of people have already abandoned their houses and moved to, uh, moved to higher ground. And so it is, uh, it, it is a heart-wrenching uh, story. I've been involved with flooding for, uh, for 10 years, and it takes a long time to recover from something like this. Right now, the uh, system is under tremendous stress. This is the right time to operate it. The Army Corps of Engineers maintained that as more water was coming downstream, they had to act fast to blow up the levee that protected Missouri farmland. There is no bubble on that Ohio River and nor on the Mississippi River that the Corps said was there. It's not there. There's a whole lot better way to skin this cat than, than to blow up a levee. With the decision to destroy the levee final, Mayor Maynard was invited to watch the explosion. I said, no, I just, I don't want to be there. The Corps had said they were going to do the blast during the daylight hours to be able to monitor it. Then they had something go wrong. Uh, they, they couldn't get it done, and so it was after. It was 10 o'clock at night when they blew it up. I didn't sleep at all last night. I got to get to Wyatt and look and see how high the water is on the levee there. The water hit that levee, our setback levee that protects East Spray, with such violent force that they were afraid that it was going to cut the levee in two. We went down to inspect a part of the levee that was never really a concern before, and it was at the very top. What if the setback levee fails? That, that's the only thing between us and dry ground. Went back the next day and it was topping at that one location and another location. And then where the Mississippi meets the Ohio right here is where they blew it. So from here over down there, all this was flooded. Just came back from the uh, levee about an hour ago, and a lot of people have gathered to look to see what the water was doing. Uh, it's really sad. Uh, one of the farmers that farms just across the levee was there watching it and asked if uh, we thought we'd ever be able to go back and farm again. Um, at this time, we just don't know. You're losing some of the cream of the crop farmland in all of the United States. So when you flood that out, not only does that impact those local farmers there, but you're losing some of the best farmland in the country. I think, uh, I think this year is just cooked. We're just not going to get a crop in the field. We're just, we're just not going to have one. It's not going to happen. Back at the Hughes farm, worry about rain and the sleepless nights was starting to affect Lincoln's health. So with all the added stress of the year, I just kept getting sicker and sicker. And, you know, you get a bad year that you're going to lose your butt on and get stressed out enough that your body, I don't know how diseases work or any of that. So how'd the doctor go? Horrible. Tell me about it. He wants me to take all of them. What for? He said all the added stress has brought on things. So do I need to give him a call and? Yeah. Probably. Figure out what's going you want to know what's going on. So is this supposed to help your stomach so you yeah. feel better? Did he suggest anything diet-wise? No more eating wheat. 
No more eating wheat. Yeah. It'll be gluten free. What the hell is gluten? It's something in wheat. No wheat. That's wheat's in everything. Yeah. Yeah, he gave me a list of what didn't have wheat. There wasn't anything on there that looked like worth eating except potatoes and meat. What? Uh, how are you going to eat in the field? I mean, you can't even have sandwiches anymore. No. I guess you're going to have to learn to cook. Gluten free. Gluten free. <sighs> Sounds like a challenge. Oh my gosh, he doesn't even want to eat. He's lost 40 pounds in the last, uh, since, since July. And I think a lot of it has to do with the stress. It makes for a really pissy day. <laughs> Just another example of the weather patterns seem to be changing here over the last several years. And it makes one wonder, is this going to be the trend over the next couple of months to couple of years? And what's around the corner next? Lincoln Hughes, second generation farmer. Mother Nature was not on his side in 2011. Last night it blew a hydraulic steering hose. It started blowing white smoke. We cracked the head. A couple hundred dollars every time just change the oil in a tracker. Everything's kind of messing up here. Well, my pivot's a piece of junk, and it's sitting broke down in the field again. I just threw my hands up in there and said, enough's enough. This is bad. Yeah. It was so hot. I mean, you didn't want to do nothing. So you'd get up in the mornings and you'd go do a few things and come back inside and watch TV all day. And you'd go out right before dark and you'd drive around these cornfields. And you could just smell them. They was, there was so much heat trying to escape. It, it just it smelled rotten. Because corn normally, it's got a nice sweet smell. You can just, the smell of a cornfield is just beautiful in my mind. And then you'd drive around them at night this year and it's like, man, we got problems. People's cornfields catching on fire all over. We were just dry everywhere. It's just too depressing. You just go to bed and hope for a surprise. And I kept thinking I had some fields of corn that was decent. I come over here one day and I couldn't find no ears. And what ears I found just had a few kernels. I realized we were screwed. Once Lincoln realized he was losing his crops, the strain started to take its toll. Just mad. How's your day? It sucks. What the heck is wrong with you? In a house full of boys, married to a farmer, the only thing you ever talk about is farming. Everything in your life revolves around farming, and you know, we don't go a day that we don't talk about it. And this year, for the first time, how was your day today? Fine. <laughs> You know, he was just so grumpy. And we would talk, and he finally just said, I just really don't want to talk about farming right now. You know, and that's your first clue when he doesn't even want to talk about the things that he loves. She knew it was going to be a bad harvest. The kids knew. I mean, you could just tell. When he doesn't have a crop to bring in, it makes him feel like a failure because, you know, we put all of our money into this crop growing season, and then there's nothing there. It's hard to keep a happy face on. I'd literally, I'd go drive around and just hide from the world, you know? I don't know how exactly to put it. He's just not getting what he deserves. We're not gonna have a lot of luck this year. <laughs> The Army Corps of Engineers blew up the levee, allowing the Mississippi to spill onto Missouri farmlands, destroying thousands of acres of crops in the process. A lot of corn, a lot of wheat. Of course, the wheat was within 30 days of harvest, somewhere around 20,000 acres. All of the money had been spent on the wheat crop when the levee was blown. I had about 2,500 acres of wheat that was in the spillway that we had already put uh, fungicide, insecticide, all the fertilizer. And everything on. A lot of those inputs just uh, kind of went down the river with the floodwaters. We just got through uh, viewing uh, the spillway. 
the uh, water is going to do a lot of damage to the houses that are there in the floodways. It's hard to tell what devastation is going on underneath the water right now. It's going to be difficult to measure that until it actually goes down. And uh, right now, we just don't know when that's going to happen. There usually is a tremendous amount of corn in the, in the floodway, and there was virtually none this year. You know, the core is responsible. With a push of the button, they injected their will upon us, and they destroyed this ground. You blew the levee, and it kind of uh, made new channels through some dirt. And I know you have the right to flood it, but I don't know that you have the right to uh, destroy it. After this year, some uh, reevaluation of, of the flood control system should take place. Will it? I don't know. Well, when you have school children in the Dakotas filling sandbags in February and the core not dropping the reservoir levels, you might have a problem. Some of them's rotted. Is that down in there? That's just mold. It's nasty. Normally, it'd be about each one of them kernels would be about twice the size, and it'd have a lot more yellow. This has got I mean, it's just a lot of white. You know, the the cob should be that long. Our cob's <laughs> that long. You know, normally a good ear of corn's like that. And, kind of shows you. <laughs> That's not corn. We've never had corn this bad. And I hope we never have it again. The only time you should have a bad corn crop is when you screw it up yourself. What's the matter today? Oh, I just got back from the fugate farm. Yeah, there ain't nothing there. It's died on the hills. It's going to be a long haul this fall, isn't it? Mm-hmm. What about the worms and the soybeans? That's why the sprayer's been running. Why are we spraying for those worms? I mean, the beans aren't going to yield that good. There's still hope for the beans. I've told you this. They're not dead like the corn. Yeah, but I mean, the potential's not there like it has been in the past couple of years. I'm here to grow a crop. I've told you this before. We got bills to pay. But if we can't grow beans, we'll have nothing. We got no corn right now. Do we? Well, no, but I mean, is it going to be that way all the way across the board? I set out this spring to grow a crop, and I'm going to grow a crop. I have worried for months, and at some point, you just have to accept that it is what it is. You may not like it, but there's nothing you can do to change it. The guy that ends up with a small crop, you know, because of a tornado or drought or hail, financially, they're going to be hurt. Normally, by now, this stack of bills would be paid. We'd have a half a million dollars sitting in the bank, ready to pay for next year's crop. As of right now, we got a million dollars worth of bills that are not paid. Pay the ones you have to. You bought that tractor. Yeah. I thought you were just going to rent that tractor. It was cheaper to buy it when we was done. You bought a $95,000 tractor instead of paying a year's rent. Why? Because we needed it. You like these crops are gonna put themselves in, do you? Well, no, but... I mean... Don't you think you should at least talk to your wife where you... I knew what you thought buy was. Buy two tractors? You get to watch in that combine, it'll have a black cloud just rolling out of it, and it's all mold. That's what my nose gets full of, and I want to hack it up all morning. Even though there ain't no corn coming in, it still wears out. For America's farmers who live from season to season, year to year, the economic forecast, combining with the horrible weather, called for a deep resolve and belief in oneself. I don't think very many people would go to work every day 
And at the end of the year, realize that they worked every day to lose money. Extremely frustrating. But what can you do about it? The cost of putting this stuff in, $200 an acre for fertilizer. Seed is about $100 an acre. Fuel, about 10 bucks an acre right there. So $25 to $35 in spraying, and then you got respray. I don't know, we ended up with basically $400 an acre probably. By the time you harvest it, maybe even more than that. That's where all the problem comes in. I don't have that much money, and my son doesn't have that much money, so you borrow the money, and now it's time to pay it back. So you pre-sell your grain, thinking that, you know, in the last five years, I've had X amount of bushels of corn. Our corn crop started off looking dynamite, but then about the time it started to pollinate was when the heat set in, and that just, I mean, it, it killed us. But, you know, you've got to fill those contracts. You, you signed on the dotted line. What do you do? You know, I, I sold too much too early. This year is the most corn I've ever sold before harvest. You know, I mean, I was setting up for progress and just set myself up for disaster. Hopefully, you know, the guys that hold the contracts will be sympathetic and understand that, you know, obviously if we had it, we give it to him. We ain't got it. Ooh, she's scared. Sold too much too quick. Then they had a drought, frost. They're ending up way short on their crop. Now the market has plunged lower. It's not only about the money, but it's the emotion of it. Because they've, they've seen their income go down, their risk go up, they're nervous. The lenders then become cautious, and it makes it hard for them to make the right decisions. Grain elevator operators were feeling the heat from their end users. The markets and the ethanol pumps needed their corn, corn the farmers couldn't supply. I had to go where I could get the farmers what money they did have coming. I'm just going to opt, and I'm just going to buy out of my contracts. I bought out what I had cash for. I'd have done it all, but the farmers got to pay me. I'm just the middle guy. They got to buy their contracts out, so I can buy my contracts out. Is it their fault? Nope. Is it my fault? Nope. It's just Mother Nature. I mean, there's going to be some people having to sell all their equipment and cattle and everything they've worked a long time to get. Yeah, I've already sold some trucks off. I've got two sprayers listed, a grain cart. I mean, they're in tractor house for sale now. I know we're gonna have to come up with some cash to get through this. It's probably just to write this year off and let's go on to next. It's not only you getting mother nature taking your crop, it's when you're all done and you gotta go to an elevator and write them a check for 50, 80, 100,000 dollars to buy out of what you didn't grow. It's pouring salt in an open wound. I mean, we've shed tears. It's heartbreaking to see your dreams just burn up in the field. And I guess it'll be a life lesson. When you lose money, as long as you know you can get by, you just roll with it. It'd been more fun to go to Vegas, I guess, and put a million dollars down on red. <laughs> because I could have got that over with a lot faster than what this is. We feed the world. We ain't just out here to screw off all day. Mother Nature doesn't like to wait. No, she, she's mean old hussy. <laughs> It was a tough year for the American farmer. Mother Nature took her toll. In southeast Missouri, where the Army Corps of Engineers blew up the levee to relieve floodwaters on the Mississippi, the farmers are still fighting to get the levee rebuilt. It's, it's been an ongoing pulling teeth to get these things accomplished. And, and I don't know what situation the, the Corps is facing. The country's broke. No one's getting money appropriated. 
And we were at a meeting in St. Louis and they just said, they don't know when or if they would get the money through normal channels, just their normal budget, it would be two to four years. We can't live with that, we can't wait, we can't wait for that. There was no um, sense of urgency about getting this back and repaired so that this doesn't happen again. For Tom Rafferty, who farms both the Missouri and Illinois sides of the Mississippi, waiting just wasn't enough. He and the other local farmers near Cairo, Illinois, decided to rebuild the levee at their own expense. We started rebuilding our levees ourselves because if we don't have, if we don't have that levee repaired, we will not get a crop in the field and that, that land will not be productive again. We're spending a lot of money every day, but we have no choice. We have to do it. Otherwise, that, that land is unproductive and you have an asset that's producing nothing. Meanwhile, in Missouri, a great deal of farmland inside the spillway needed repairing. There was some ground that was eroded bad enough that, that it has laid out all year and may never be farmed again. I've been out a quarter million dollars in just fixing uh, holes and dipping ditches out that were uh, silted in because of the levee. We're not going to get a crop in Illinois. Uh, the crop in Missouri is not going to be great. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do to rebuild our levees and hopefully be ready for next year. Let's see if Mother Nature will cooperate, but she's going to do what she wants. The Sixta family, which suffered terrible losses when their farm was destroyed by a tornado, persevered and survived with the help of their family and friends. People brought food and, and water and um, offered to help. And after the storm, they were our salvation. They helped us, oh, I don't know, for months. Months. Trying to get stuff picked up here. No, I said you've got to carry insurance. I don't care how good you think you are, how much fortune money you got. It costs a lot of money to rebuild. Randy and Lisa needed to decide if this tragedy was too much or if they were strong enough to continue battling Mother Nature. Because we could have not rebuilt. The insurance company could have wrote us a check and we could have cashed it out and not rebuilt the farm. And uh, we decided to rebuild the farm back because that's what we're here for. It's definitely been a tough road, that's for sure, but um, we'll get there. And do the things you gotta do to survive. So we went from wet to a tornado to dry. To dry. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been an interesting year. It's kind of like playing the game Survivor. <laughs> <laughs> The Hughes family lost most of their corn crop to the worst drought in 30 years. Fortunately, they were able to get some income out of their bean crop. About 35 miles from home. This is our farthest east farms we have. These beans haven't had much rain in here, but the ground holds water a little different than it does at home. These will be the best beans we cut all year. It makes you realize what you could have had. And that's the worst part. We knew that at home we could have beans like this if we just could have got a little rain. Having the good yields, it'll help. It'll pay some more bills. It ain't enough to offset everything else we've lost, but it makes you realize that next year you can do this on every acre. So it'll put the drive back in you. Come spring, we'll be ready to plant them again. And won't be thinking twice about the bad year because we know we can grow some good crops and we're gonna grow them. Mother Nature has a way of taking things away from you and I wish she wouldn't, but she does. This year's been uh, bad. Uh, next year's gotta be better. We are eternal optimists. One thing about it, we'll live through it. Yep. There'll be another day tomorrow. Yep, there will be. It takes hard times to season you to appreciate the good times. You go forward, you don't look at the bad side, you gotta look at the good side. You gotta be an optimist, you gotta look forward. If you look for the bad side, you ain't gonna be here. We can do it, and we're gonna get it done, and we're gonna, you know, go on. Um, it's not gonna win, we're not gonna let the weather win. You know, we've had our up years and down years, and the last couple of years, we 
did really well and things were looking great and you know it just takes that one year to take you right back down and it'll take us a couple of years to dig our way back out of it but we'll we'll do it when you farm for a living you face um, adversity every year it's just mother nature i mean we got to go with the flow we will plant crops come spring and we will go on like nothing ever happened hopefully mother nature will cooperate, uh, but it's not something we can control. But certainly uh, farmers uh, are, are a bunch of people that uh, are pretty motivated. We're going to be all right. It's just, uh, it's just been one of those years from, you know, from hell. We'll be back next year. We love doing it, some years more than others. I know next year's going to be better. I love what I do. I wouldn't trade it for anything. It'll be all right, Abel. We'll, we'll make it. We'll move on. Next year could be, next year could be our year.